Our next speaker is Timothy Kirchival, farm manager at the International Center of Kentucky. Timothy is a full-time farmer and agri ag agriculture consultant who deserves cooperative and regenerative agricultural solutions for both urban and rural settings. He contracts as a farmer slash consultant with private properties, organizations, and public institutions across Kentucky and Tennessee to build new farms, improve existing farm systems, and transform lawns to gardens, or serve as a farm manager. All of the systems he designs are biodiverse and food productive and combine agriculture with education. Please welcome Timothy. Good morning. How many of y'all have a garden or live on a farm or have grandparents or parents that do? How many garden or are tied to the land in some way? How many have had their hands in soil in the last year? Raise your hands. That's awesome, that's Kentuckians right there. That's great. Okay, well, I'm, I'm really glad that I got to follow up with Kellen because she, her presentation leads directly into mine and uh, restoration ecology is a super interesting, incredibly important area of study. And I think that those of us who are gardeners or small farmers can have a big impact on the future of the successes in restoration ecology as we learn to manage spaces into high productivity and biodiversity by reimagining our relationship to the land where we are. So I want to tell a story about that today. But first, just a brief introduction about what it is that I do. I contract with farms in rural areas, 700 acres in western Tennessee, out by Memphis, 800 acres out in eastern Kentucky, uh, up in Louisville with homesteads, down in Nashville with lawns to gardens here in Bowling Green. I've helped several property owners transform their lawns into heavy productivity, biodiverse, food gardens, and then I also serve as farm manager with the International Center of Kentucky, and that's the story that I want to talk about today. So Bowling Green is a federal resettlement city for refugees, and at all times, approximately 10 to even 12 percent of the city population is a refugee population. Now, in the questions that I gave to you all to consider while we're talking today, I asked, what do you think that it would be like if you were torn away from the place of your birth, the place where you had had your hands in soil, where you knew the trees, the grasses, the animals, the people, the memories, the culture, and you had to start again anew? What sorts of things could help bring you back to some therapeutic remembrance of the joy that you once felt, and how could you relearn to grow in happiness and harmony and make new friends and earn a living in the new place where you find yourself? The International Center of Kentucky here in Bowling Green helps refugees do just that. And there are thousands that go to the center. Every single day, there's hundreds. There's hundreds there today. All of them are being helped find new employment, find housing, um, and learn to support their families here now. And one of the ways that we've learned to do that with the International Center is by developing an urban commercial farm. Now, I want you to imagine a small space, probably about, you know, it's not even the size of this room. It's really about 100 feet by 100 feet. That's all. But you're going to see the amount of productivity that we get out of it. Imagine it, nothing but Bermuda grass. You know that wire grass that always gets up into your garden in the summertime and chokes out all the crops? Nothing but that. You know when you stick your hands down into the soil and you find that good black rich loam, that good soil organic matter? None of that. It's just an urban lawn that was meant to be built upon back in the 70s and never was. And it's just been mowed forever since. There's no topsoil. It's all just brick red clay, almost as hard as the stage, with grass above it. And in two years' time, we've turned it in to a highly productive garden that we're going to see here. Now, this project 
um, is with the International Center of Kentucky, like I said, and Kentucky State University. You remember that another one of the questions that I gave to you to consider is, if, if you didn't have access to a farm, if you didn't own a farm, if your family didn't own one, how could partnering with a civic organization or an institution that had some land help you facilitate a farm in that space? The International Center of Kentucky has strength within, its, within itself as an organization with a budget you know, that's in about a million to a couple million dollars a year. So they have their own internal strength to fund projects. They also, much, much easier than, than I myself as an individual or you yourselves as individuals, they have the opportunity and the accessibility to join in partnership with other institutions in the regional community, like Western Kentucky University, or in this case, Kentucky State University. Kentucky State is a land-grant university that has a special emphasis on sustainable farming, especially oriented towards facilitating people of color develop their own farming economies. Now, this farm started by a partnership between the International Center of Kentucky, Kentucky State University. And in virtue of us partnering those two institutions, an even bigger one, the United States Department of Agriculture, through the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, provided us a grant to get the farm started. I could never have done that as an individual. So one of the things that I want you to consider as we go out into the world and into society is think not so much about what you do as the heroic individual. Instead, learn how to harmonize what your passions are with the structures of your community so that you can build off that internal strength. Together with young refugees and old refugees, ranging all the way from kids about your age to people in their 50s and 60s, we farm together in this commercial garden space. And the harvest that we've made, this is some of our garlic harvest. This was some of approximately 2,500 to 3,000 garlic that we harvested. Remember, it's just a space about 100 feet by 100 feet, and you'll see it. So here's some overviews of that space. Our executive director of the International Center, Albert Mbanfu, is in the background inspecting the garlic. And Condela Camulete from Democratic Republic of Congo, one of my best farmers, he farms with me every day. Um, he's actually employed to farm with me, and I'll talk about that in a minute. He's here with me, and together you can see in the foreground, we've got blueberry shrubs, there's garlic, Condela and I are harvesting carrots, and then the massive garlic crop. After we make the harvests, what my responsibility, responsibility is to do, among make, making sure that the farm is well-managed and highly productive, is to bring people to the farm to purchase the farm products because our goal is to create healthy food with the refugees, provide them with food, provide them with a therapeutic space where they can reconnect to the soil, reconnect out in the open air, the open sky with birds singing, making music, dancing sometimes with their friends, and taking home some healthy food, but also making money off of the sale of the products so that it can fund the farm and sustain it for future time, and the International Center doesn't have to keep you know, paying for it. So the farm, uh, let's see, we also, besides selling at the International Center, we sell at the Southern Kentucky, the Soki Farmer's Market down here under the pavilion, uh, and uh, that's called Soko in Swahili, which is their language. And Condela and Masoka there have come to the farmer's market with me to sell. So there we're selling some of our garlic and our carrots. There's a great diversity of crops that are on the farm, ranging from fruits uh, like uh, strawberries, um, wild plums, trees, mulberries, and blueberries. And everybody who farms there gets to enjoy that. And we have enough to sell into the community. On special days throughout the year, 
when we have massive harvests, like 2,500 garlic to harvest, or as you'll see later, 1,500 pounds of sweet potatoes, we organize again with other organizations and institutions in the community like local churches or schools or other civic organizations to come and have community days where they work with our refugees and we make the harvests together and then prepare them for sale. Also, we organize with local businesses. So this place called Preservation is a local wine shop. A lot of people at WKU go there on a weekly basis and it's a great place. They've invited us in every single week. They allow me to bring everything that's in season. And so I just come and fill up whole tables and make purchases or uh, make sales uh, to the people that come there. And we've made several hundreds of dollars off of these sales. Also, since, as I said at the beginning, I farm across Tennessee and Kentucky, I also use some of the crops as seeds. You know how you can collect your own garlic seed or you can collect your own kale or arugula or make your own sweet potato slips or pumpkin seeds. And I use those in the other farms that I manage. That also helps the International Center make money because, for instance, this 800-acre farm out at a Zen Center in Eastern Kentucky purchased garlic seed from our International Center. Now, Kentucky has some serious challenges as far as its agricultural and farming economy is concerned. There are approximately, I think, 37,000 farms in Kentucky. I can't remember the exact figures, but I know this, that roughly half, in fact, 60% of farms in Kentucky are only bringing in a revenue of about $10,000 a year. And half of those only bring in a revenue of $2,000 a year. Well, look, on a 100 by 100 foot space, on an urban lawn with no soil fertility, we were able to build up the soil fertility and organize so well with the institutions and organizations and businesses of our community that last year we made over $2,000 in sales. So this little 100 by 100 space, besides feeding the refugees that manage it and others who come to the center and giving some away to the community, besides all that, is bringing in as much revenue as about 25% of all Kentucky farms. That's incredible. And as you're thinking about how you can partner with organizations and institutions in the future, we, if we also remember what Kellen was talking about with food deserts, a lot of the times these are in urban communities where people don't own farms. They don't have their own gardens. But if you partner with an organization or institution, then you can create a new farm economy right there. Now, how many lawns are there in Bowling Green? How many? 5,000? 10,000? 75,000? Probably around those figures. A 100 by 100 space brought in $2,000 of sales and created more than a ton of sold food last year. If we multiply that throughout our urban communities, how much food can we create? Huge megatons of food can be created in spaces where people never imagined having an agricultural economy. And that can help protect our wild spaces where our restoration ecologists are doing so much work to protect ecosystems from ecosystem degradation. Right now, we have 180 million acres in the United States every year of corn and soybeans. That's way too many. And it's devastating for our ecosystems, both on land and our waterways. And in Kentucky, we have these subterranean waterways under the karst, these underground rivers that help build our cave systems. So our reimagination of the farming economy can help produce so much food that it protects wild spaces and takes away the need for putting so much pressure on that farmland. And that can help our restoration ecologists do what they do best. Now, Kondela and Masoka here from Democratic Republic of Congo are both employed, as have others been, employed to work with me on a daily basis. So they make money not just by the sale of the crops, but they just make money as farmers every single day. And we were able to do that because we partnered up again with other local institutions. Let me see if I can get this 
can we uh, get to the next slide somehow? Oh, there we go. Okay. Now you'll see an overview of the garden and how much abundance. You can see about 3,000 garlic cabbages is coming off of this space. Like I said, more than a ton of food. In our community volunteer days, we've got corn, we've got beans, we've got cabbage. You see in between the purple cabbages how there's greens that are growing. We're double cropping, so even in a space that's just this big, we're getting a couple of hundred cabbages out of it and a bunch of greens. Just that one row in itself can make about $400. On our community sweet potato, what is in Swahili called Vyazi Day, we have 1,500 pounds that we harvested. And here's some of our harvest that you can see. All of these got sold or eaten by the refugees, um, not only here in Bowling Green to restaurants, but also in Springfield, Tennessee, to the Southside Drug Company Pharmacy, where I've also started another farm with the owners. So the farm crops from our place go down and get sold at the pharmacy, and also at the Bowling Green International Food Market. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's right here downtown. So we've gotten our food into grocery stores too. Then our farmers have partnered up with the Housing Authority of Bowling Green and created this five-acre urban farm that serves the 1,100 residents of the Housing Authority. So as we, as we close, I just want to say that I really want you again to consider how you in the future can partner with your civic institutions and organizations and maybe reimagine the land that's right in front of you to bring those Kentucky skills that you've got with the soil and rethink our agricultural economy so that it benefits everyone, not just people that own farms, but even refugees who come to this country and so that it protects our ecosystems so our restoration ecologists can do their work. Thank you so much.